question in the afternoon. I hope you had a good lunch. Our next, next speaker is from the other side of the Atlantic, uh, the President and the CEO of EDUCOURSE. Please join me in welcoming John O'Brien with his talk on digital ethics. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? All right. Thank you, Pekka. I asked him to be very short because there's very little chance I'm going to finish all my slides, so I'm going to start running right from the very beginning. I want to tell you how wonderful it is to be here, and I send greetings from your friends and colleagues at EDUCAUSE. Uh, it's an honor to be here with our friends at UNIS and many other organizations that we work with, represented by some of you out there. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you about digital ethics because I think it is one of the most important issues for 20 2019 and beyond. Uh, I also want to tell you that I, I talk to you about digital ethics with some humility as well. First of all, I'm not an ethics professor. Second of all, I'm in Europe, and Europe is clearly leading the way when it comes to privacy and GDPR. So I want to acknowledge that, and then I'll share my perspective, but this is the start of a conversation that I think will go on for some time. I believe that the definition of digital ethics for me is doing the right thing at the place where social values meet technology innovation. And even though that's a very simple definition, you can see the complexity and the slipperiness because what happens when the value of cool technology comes in conflict with the value of privacy? And, and so who wins when the values conflict? And, and why do we blame technology for the behavior of people? There's all kinds of complexity within this even very simple definition. I believe that when we think about technology innovation, we need to look back to see forward. And so I think sometimes we think that this is the first century that's been captivated by technology innovation and this great frenzy of innovation and, and, and dealing with the ethics of technology innovation. Of course, the 19th century was the century for this same kind of flurry of information and also worry about the ethics of the technology that was being developed. I mean, this is the century that brought the great exhibitions in France from 1798 to 1849. There were 11 different exhibitions featuring these wonderful new technologies and getting excited and almost recklessly uh, optimistic about what technology could accomplish. In Great Britain in 1851 was the Great Exhibition of 1851. The profits from the Great Exhibition are still being used to fund research in the UK. One third of the population of Great Britain came to London to see the Great Exhibition. There were all kinds of, of technologies on display. Uh, the award went to a telescope, the medal went to early photography. Uh, there was a precursor of fax machines on display. My favorite exhibition was the Leech Barometer. Uh, this was a way they used, they found that when the uh, air pressure went down, leeches would climb up a bottle, and so they found a way to have a bell ring when the leeches climbed up. Uh, so that's just one example of the many things that were on display. Not everyone thought this was great. There were some people, even then, who were thinking about the ethics of technology. One of them who came to the Great Exhibition was Karl Marx. It turns out he was not swooning over these new technologies. He thought it was exploitative, and he thought that uh, there were actually implications for violence, and he wasn't wrong, right? Because the 19th century also brought us the rise of the Luddites, pushing back violently against technology that was taking their jobs. So these are not new things. These, these, we can look back to the century before us. The 19th century is also the century of Frankenstein, the first science fiction novel in English written by Mary Shelley in the 1800s. Uh, the summary of the book is one that I've heard this phrase used today. Just because you can do something with technology doesn't mean you should. And who's the villain of Frankenstein? It's Victor Frankenstein, the inventor, who acts without ethics, who, who uses technology he doesn't understand without thinking of the ethical implications. So, uh, and all of these worries about the ethics of these new technologies all came to pass with some of the exploitation and some of the many problems and social issues that were created by technology innovation 
and in the 19th century, the great icon would be railways, and even those had societal and cultural implications. Uh, go across the ocean to where I'm from, and these are not trivial social implications. Uh, if you think of the damage that was done to indigenous peoples, think of two technologies, rifles and railways, and basically allowed the decimation of the buffalo population, which essentially was what the indigenous peoples relied on for their subsistence. So as we look ahead, I think it's important, and so does one of my favorite scholars, Audrey Waters, says, as we get uh, captured by these new technologies and shiny objects, let's not forget the past. Let's remember that as we go forward into all of these exciting new changes ahead. So my title has it multiple ways. I want to say that I'm excited about new technologies, that I'm deeply cautious and concerned about the ethical implications of them, um, and that I have hope. So we're going to start with all the things that I'm excited about, and I, I, I won't have time to go into all of these. Many of the sessions that I've heard just so far today capture some of the excitement about uh, mixed reality, adaptive learning, predictive analytics, uh, artificial intelligence, even digital assistance, uh, so many exciting applications in the realm of higher education IT. Uh, if you want to learn more, pick up the Educause Horizon report and you can see num a number of the things that I'm excited about that we're going to start to see in the next few years over the horizon. If I picked one big story about how technology is going to change higher education, I would probably pick the Jill Watson story. Do you remember? There's maybe two people who don't know the Jill Watson story. This was the uh, uh, Watson, IBM Watson powered teaching assistant at the University of, or at Georgia Tech. Tech, Georgia Tech, and, uh, and uh, the, the story was that the students didn't know it was a chat bot, it was artificial intelligence, um, and the instructor who created it talks about um, how they had to make her slower to respond, uh, and in fact how they finally found out that it was not a person was because she was so quick to give the students responses. Uh, when they found out it was a chat bot, you know the story, one of the students said, oh, I was going to nominate her for a teaching award. Yeah, so very, very big story in, in America, certainly. Um, and it's just an exact kind of story that we think of when we think of digital ethics. On the one hand, the, the same facts have led to two very strong responses. Some think this is so wonderful. Others think this is the robot overlords taking over and we're all doomed to destruction. So I do want to move to thinking about some of the real cautions that I think um, uh, I'll try to take you on a tour of some of the reasons why I think digital ethics is a very, very important topic for us to be thinking about in 2019. I mean, there are the obvious cases of CRISPR babies. This story just came out last month. I mean, this is right out of Frankenstein, right? In fact, Mary Shelley was inspired by some early experiments in the 19th century involving electricity and animals. And here we have people thinking it might be a really good idea to reanimate pig brains. Not everyone agrees. There's technologies to 3D print guns and people thinking it's a good idea to share those online. Um, news stories just out in the last few months about um, drones, unmanned fighters, military applications of some of these technologies. All this is happening so quickly while we're still still trying to understand the technologies themselves, not to mention the digital ethical implications of these technologies. Um, I won't spend much time talking about it, but if you really want to lose sleep, think about the weaponized AI and how that's going to completely change phishing and, and change all sorts of things. The, you know, the example, if I could only give you one example, it would be the fake videos, the deep fake technology that's just been really in the last year or year and a half. Uh, this is a fake video. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, I thought it best not to continue since he makes a couple of <laughs> remarks about our current president. So, uh, fake videos, you know, you think about the, I'll give one example. Do you remember the stories a few years ago about the, that, that someone desecrated the Koran? And there were riots because of that story, and 17 people died as a result. Now imagine a fake video showing, 
in a fake video this happening. Imagine a world leader making incendiary comments before an election. It's not hard to imagine how we move from a cute fake video to actual geopolitical instability. So very, very problematic technologies and their applications. And clearly, you know, e evil people will do evil things with these new tools. Uh, alas, that's an inevitability. Um, but I'm more interested in the unintentional uh, technologies that have deep ethical ramifications. And the best example of this is from a few years back. Do you remember Tay, the Microsoft uh, chatbot? Now, you might have thought there were all kinds of reasons that somebody would have taken a deep breath before turning Tay on. You know, the idea that we would have a female avatar that would be, uh, that will get smarter the more people talk, that would be listening and learning, that, that someone might have said, this is an irresistible target for really bad people. <laughs> but instead, and you know this story, uh, Tay went from humans are super cool to basically full out fascist within 24 hours and eventually uh, Tay was taken down. Now I looked into what are, what's the Tay version 2.0 and the best example I could find uh, was Mitsuku and Mitsuku is an award winning chatbot uh, developed by Steve Warswick from the UK um, and, and I actually uh, downloaded or actually you can just go on the internet and log in and you can have a conversation. I should mention all my slides will be made available and I have URLs for every slide so you don't need to feel you need to take any pictures. So I went and talked to Mitsuko a little bit. I tested her. I said, hi there. Uh, who is Tay? She says, a chatbot designed by Microsoft. I said, what happened to Tay? And she said, Microsoft took it offline after it started spewing racist nonsense. Well, that's pretty good, right? I went on and said, do you make mistakes? And she said, Mitsuko series is incapable of error. To which I said, incapable of humility? And this is brilliant. Her response was, have you ever been to Europe? <laughs> Perfect, right? So chatbots are maturing, uh, but we still have, have a ways to go, perhaps. Um, this is how Mitsuko responds to the abuse uh, that happens. Show me a really dirty girl, and that's what they got. Um, but, but it was pretty stunning. The reason I like Mitsuko is not just because it's award-winning, but because Steve Warswick, the creator of it, actually lectures and talks about ethics. So he's building this chatbot clearly with ethics in mind throughout. Uh, and it's a bit stunning that he says that 30% of the input is either suggestive or sexually explicit or abusive or swearing or something like that. It's interesting. I mean, this is all happening. Most of the examples I'm giving you are in the last few months. I think this is in the last week that the UN came out with a study. Did you see this? And the study is called I'd Blush If I Could. I'd Blush If I Could is the response that Siri gives if you say, Siri, you're a slut. And that's stunning, and the report is talking about the tremendous problem with bias that's built into these systems. Uh, why in the world, in a, the, uh, the era of Me Too, would we have a female chatbot who would have, they say, a catch-me-if-you-can flirtation uh, response to what's clearly abusive and inappropriate commentary. So the more you look into AI, which is something I'll be talking about throughout this presentation, it's obviously not just the technology, it gets caught up in power, culture, politics, and people, which is why ethics is such a big deal. It's not just the technology, but, and yet that's all that's being developed. It's, it, we're not, the technology is moving quicker than the ethical conversations are, needless to say. So if you ask um, Americans, they will tell you that, that they have mixed opinions about AI. And uh, there's all kinds of the Pew research, MIT research consistently shows the same thing. And it's no wonder if you look at the headlines over the past year and a half, they've been really stunningly, consistently dismal. <laughs> and, and almost all of these headlines have ethical implications, whether it's breaches or, or um, inappropriate sharing of information or bias built into these systems, it, it's pretty consistent. Meanwhile, the chatbots march on, right? Meanwhile, the technologies are continuing to be developed. Here's two data points that take my breath away. Well, the first is just that chatbots are growing and growing and growing, and we know that. But the first data point is that 27% of consumers aren't sure if their last interaction was with a human or not. 
<laughs> That's one. The second one is that by 2020, it's expected that the average person will have more conversations with bots than their spouse. <laughs> I told this to my spouse, and she said, finally, relief is on site. <laughs> She's actually quite looking forward to it. So what I thought I might do in trying to present the idea of, of what is the state of digital ethics in 2019 would be, wait, what year is it? <laughs> Um, would be to look at three of the most influential books in English, and I'm sure there are books in the language of your country as well that, that should be looked at, but the three that I would point to um, start with Kathy O'Neill's um, Weapons of Math Destruction. This came out a few years ago, 2016. It's still talked about um, by academics all the time. And I love her definition in which she says, algorithms are opinions embedded in code. And so when you start to imagine how did all of these, how did this bias get built in? You know, the algorithms are no better than the opinions, the assumptions, the bias, the discrimination that are built into it by the developers who are focused on the technology, not on the ethical implications of what they're doing, um, unfortunately. Um, Kathy O'Neill says that more data doesn't always make better decisions. And that's so counterintuitive, isn't it? Because we think more data is better decisions every single time. And she gives the example when she spoke at an event um, of orchestra auditions. Because, you know, if you go back several decades, there are almost no women in major orchestras in the US anyway. I can't speak to Europe. What changed that? Well, it was by making auditions closed, by putting a curtain up, by having carpet so you can't hear what kind of shoes people are wearing. The minute they did that, the number of women in orchestras went way up um, by, by t three or four times. And so good, d good decisions aren't necessarily the result of more and more data. And she talks about, when she says weapons of math destruction, she's talking about um, when decisions are made by a system that is opaque, when you can't appeal the decision because there's nobody to appeal to. Uh, if a computer algorithm says you're denied a loan, how do you appeal that? There's no person to appeal to. And then she says a WMD also has to work at scale, so not one decision that's bad, but, but a whole uh, series of them, and also that just has to be harmful to meet her definition of a WMD. The one example she gives, she also is bothered by the fact that these systems use data proxies. So if they can't tell what if, if Peck is a good driver, should we charge him more for insurance than someone else? Uh, they use credit scores as a proxy for whether we should make his price lower than hers. And as a result of this strange proxy uh, you have in Florida, adults with good driving records but poor credit scores paying $1,500 more than people with good credit scores and a drunk driving conviction, which is you know, a great example because it's so unthinkable. Uh, and since her book came out, there's so many other stories that just mounting and mounting about the, the sort of the flaws in systems that have opinions built into the algorithms that haven't been interrogated appropriately. Um, probably the best example, though, would be the algorithms that go into autonomous cars, uh, because there are tremendous ethical implications of that. Does anybody know about the trolley problem? Uh, it's an ethical, it would be in any ethics textbook you look at, it's, it's what if a trolley is going down a track and you're sitting there and you can change the track, and if you see the illustration at the top, the trolley, if you don't do anything, is going to kill five people. If you change the track, it will kill one person. What do you do? Well, autonomous cars make decisions like this all the time. I mean, not with life or death, but sometimes life or death. And so these systems build, in, be, build really profound um, assumptions into their analytics. And so it's a great example of how high the stakes can be. It's one thing when it's a credit score. It's another thing when somebody is going to live or not. Imagine you're driving down a tunnel, there's a car coming towards you, and somebody moves out behind that car, and you're in an autonomous car. Is it going to crash into this one or that one? If there's no choice, the car will make a decision.
Um, another great book is um, Sophia Noble's book in 2018 called Algorithms of Oppression. And she looked into uh, some of the bias built into search engines. And she says, you know, why in the world we assume a search engine is just looking at the facts when in fact it's opinions embedded in code. And she wonders, why would we allow Google to finish our sentences when, when, when we may not want, like the way those sentences go? And in fact, she gives the powerful, powerful example of Dylan Roof. Dylan Roof was the man who walked into a church in America and shot nine African Americans. Uh, and, and she tells the story when they looked at his search history. And he talked about, uh, in his manifesto, he talked about going to Google and doing a search and finding evidence of black on white violence, which is not a true thing. It's fake news. But he saw it. He found it through a search engine. And he thought, because it's a search engine, it must be real, like most people would. And so that is, again, a powerful example of the, tech, uh, the implications, uh, ethical implications of these technologies that we assume are so straightforward. Uh, many headlines on the bias built into these algorithms, you know, it's just every few months the direction of them changes. Lately it's a lot about the bias of recognition software. Uh, this video I saw go, go um, viral of the racist soap dispenser that, that only sees white people when they try to wash their hands. <laughs> So just to give you, an, you know, if, 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 some people may think that, well, if these are, if algorithms are opinions embedded in code, eventually we'll figure out how to make a soap dispenser not racist by improving the code, probably. I think the real worry is, and then what, right? The real challenge uh, right now is bias, but when we solve for the bias, then we have a whole other set of ethical challenges in which the computer sees everything, and, and, and what does that mean? Which leads me to the third book, and, and this is a very powerful book. It's very dense. Uh, it's a book that came out this year, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff, and she, uh, the, just to show you how dense it is, she has, I think, nine different definitions of what surveillance capitalism is. But essentially, she's talking about this new mutant form of capitalism in which the, the thing being capitalized is our human experience. And she uses the powerful turn of phrase she says, if I can remember it, uh, she says, we think that applications are free, but in fact, we're paying for them just in a different cost. We think that we're using social media, but in fact, social media is using us. We think that we're searching Google, when in fact, Google is searching us. And then she ends with saying, we think that companies have privacy policies, but instead, she says, they have surveillance policies. So it's too dense a book to say much more than that, but I would encourage you to take a look at it. It's very forward thinking. You know, I, I strongly think that she's raising a question that will maybe be her next book will be surveillance fascism, which is a whole other animal with some pretty powerful implications these days. So it, Educause has started to also think about some of these things. If you look at, the, at our top 10 IT issues list, you can really see a lot of these ethical implications built into privacy, which is number three, you know, information security, which is number one. Uh, half of the top 10 IT issues for 2019 are involving data. So I think we're also very interested in pursuing these. Uh, what we're also starting to realize is that you know, higher education is, is using data. And, and we are finding out for ourselves that there may be some creepiness involved. Um, this, this report by the New America Foundation has a pretty powerful story of, of two presidents. One was the president of Mount St. Mary's, you know the story perhaps, who gave students a study and then used that to identify the 20 or 25 students who probably weren't going to be successful and were going to bring down their numbers. And so he's the one who said, we need to get those students to leave. And he used the unfortunate metaphor of a Glock to the bunny. Remember that? And he's no longer the president of that 
institution. And then on the other hand is Georgia State University with a president who's talking about using data, predictive analytics to focus on student success and serve the needs of our students. So we're, we're also struggling with how do we deal with data in a way that is ethical. Uh, you think I just pick one example of what is to me a truly exciting technology, the, the VR and AR. Um, you know, but we, we the eth anybody who wonders about the ethics of these things, you just want to point them back to Second Life, which now is kind of like a shady, <laughs> shady place to hang out. Uh, I won't tell you about my experience when I tried to teach a course in Second Life. It didn't go well. Um, but, but we have some uh, folks in the Educause community, uh, Emery Craig and Maya Georgevina are two scholars writing about the implica ethical implications of VR. Uh, here's what they say, harassment, student data, student privacy, accessibility, all of these as being really critical uh, concerns with the application of virtual reality for learning. Uh, here's some European uh, scholars talking about the psychological implications of VR, which is a whole other uh, dimension of ethical consideration. So, I would like to think that uh, we can eventually move from talking about the hype and the ethical implications of moving so quickly to really some elements of hope. And I'll use the last uh, few minutes I have to talk about that. I think the question for us is, right now there's not a single clear voice in, uh, in our community talking about digital ethics, but there's all kinds of voices emerging. And I think it's interesting to imagine who will lead uh, going forward. So here are some candidates. Uh, one emerging voice is, of course, the voice of regulation and the voice of uh, GDPR and others who are using that as a tool to ensure more ethical consideration. Of course, Europe is moving very quickly, while America not so much. Um, there's a couple of uh, indications in America. San Francisco banning facial recognition is one that's gotten a lot of notice, um, and it's quite a volume of interest when Microsoft urges, right? When you have one of the major technology companies urging regulation, you know that something very interesting is happening. Uh, so in great contrast, on the one hand, the UK, this is just in the last few weeks, talking about holding technology executives uh, responsible for uh, inappropriate behavior. And then at the same time, on the other end of the ocean, in the US, we're sort of thinking of adopting elements of GDPR, but not all of them. Uh, and a few states, you know, California has done that. But So it's early yet. It's not clear the role that regulation is going to play worldwide, though clearly in Europe it's very strong. One really interesting emerging voice, and you know, is the voice of employees. Uh, and we've seen uh, in the case of some of the large technology companies, we've seen employees do walkouts, we've seen employees leave, we've seen employees uh, sign petitions. Uh, this is a new thing, and it's quite remarkable. Uh, and the best example of the fragility of the current situation would be the case of, of Google, where they tried to set up an ethics board, and then people objected to a couple of the people on the ethics board, and then within seven days they said, no, nah, we're not going to do the <laughs> ethics board, and right now there is none, and there's no clear pathway forward on that. So very, very early the role that employees, they're clearly flexing their muscles, and we'll see where that leads. Um, I have to say, I think there's the role of creative expressions is going to play an important role. I mean, throughout the history of technology, you know, whether it's science fiction or movies or other expressions of creativity, I, I don't think that can be underestimated. I think they're telling a story that people are listening to and it captures their imagination in a real way. I mean, we think of Star Trek predicting the technology, but actually Star Trek did a great job of predicting so many of the social problems and ethical implications of technology that we're talking about uh, today. One of my favorite, and this is my last example here, is ASU's Center for Science and the Imagination. Uh, they're, they're not only looking at science fiction, looking at fiction, but also just looking at creative studies of technology. And I think that'll be an interesting one to watch. But clearly, the, the, my final point, and the one that I think is so important, is that I honestly believe that higher education can, should, must lead the way when it comes to digital ethics. I mean, the superpower of higher education education we all know is not speed. The superpower of higher education is being deliberate, being thoughtful, being comprehensive, and that is what is needed. We don't need another 
fast. <laughs> we need thoughtful, uh, deliberative, comprehensive thinking about the implications of these new technologies. And I think no one can do that better than higher education. Um, some people are already starting to talk about that. What's very interesting about this article is that it's written by the CEO of an ed tech company. So think about that for a while. Um, this is my favorite headline, Americans place the most trust in universities to build AI. But I'm lying a little bit. First of all, if you look at the actual data, it's not that close. It's not like they love higher ed and no, it's, and I actually kind of lied about the headline as well because they're also pretty fond of the military, which is a whole other uh, kettle of fish. Um, so let me end by suggesting there's four ways that I think higher education can, will, must, should lead. Um, and the first is through just some very audacious leadership that's happening, and I'll give a couple quick examples. Uh, if you want to read an inspiring strategic plan for the future, read Georgia Tech's 2040 plan. It is full of technology. They are, they are thinking now about the technology that's going to be in place in 2040, and it's so many of the things that we are talking about with online learning, but also uh, analytics-rich advising, putting students in the center, using artificial intelligence in appropriate ways, and it's a very thoughtful study I'd encourage you to look at. The other example is Northeastern University. The, the, the other book I could have mentioned is Robot Proof, uh, which is an excellent study of, of artificial intelligence, but more than just a study, the author, the president of Northeastern University in Boston, and is arguing that, that rather than basically fearing artificial intelligence and worrying about the jobs it's going to take, instead we need to be redesigning our curriculum to embrace those elements that can't be automated. Creativity, he, he actually proposes a new discipline, a new way of thinking called humanics that embraces the humanities and realizes that that is what we need to bring to the table when it comes to artificial intelligence. Uh, and so he's in the process of redesigning the curriculum at Northeastern uh, to, to be robot-proof in the future. The last example I give is, is Southern New Hampshire University. We hear all about what they're doing with online. Southern New Hampshire University is also bringing education to refugee camps in some of the poorest, hardest hit areas of the world. And they're, they're starting to use artificial intelligence. They want to bring down the cost of education for those uh, to uh, $1,000 a year. Um, I think higher education will and can lead in developing research. We know the big universities, the elite universities, Harvard and Stanford are doing this. We knew that in 2019, MIT will be investing a billion dollars to create a new university to talk about, a new college to talk about artificial intelligence. They're going to create 50 faculty positions. Stanford, uh, a week after MIT announced that, announced the creation of a, of a new center for, so there's a lot happening in higher education when it comes to responding to this, uh, 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 the ethical implications of these new technologies. Uh, one of my favorite things that's happening in higher education is people are talking now about creating a new field of study called machine behavior. Uh, we saying that we can't have the people who write the code analyzing and assessing the behavior. We need other people, we need scientists and sociologists looking at machine behavior to understand what's really happening. A number of institutions, associations, are also developing ethics codes and policies, and of course this is really, really important. Uh, we've written in Educaz about the rise of chief privacy officers, and we think that's uh, going to play a key role in helping to raise the understanding of how to respond in this really challenging field as well well. And my last is really planting a seed, and it's a hope and a dream, but uh, all my degrees are in literature and English and writing, and there was a thing uh, for all of my career called writing across the curriculum. It was the belief that every course should include writing because it's so important for student learning. And my hope and dream would be that we will eventually see ethics across the curriculum, and we'll see students in all fields taking up ethical, so that, so that when the technology changes in ways we can't predict, we'll be ready to respond to it. If you want my slides, email me and I'll be happy to provide them. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, John. <laughs> yeah. What a firework. Um,
maybe, I mean, we could have a couple of questions here, and then after the session we will have, of course, the lounge where additional questions can be asked. But is there anything quick you want to ask? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, Audi Tasala, CSC IT Center for Science, Finland. Um, thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, in the UNIS board, we've discussed how we want to encourage more diversity, uh, especially get more women involved in UNIS and also in the board of UNIS. And I wonder, have you faced similar um, issue at EDUCORS and what kind of measures did you put in place to encourage uh, diversity, equity and inclusion? Thank you. Uh, I was so rushed for time, I, I actually had slides that I had to take out, but clearly another ethical implication right now is the, the lack of representation of women and diverse populations. I mean, how can you have developers developing code with bias built into it? Well, because they don't represent the broader population. Uh, I think that diversity, equity, inclusion is a critical priority for EDUCAUSE. Uh, it's a social justice issue, but it's also an effectiveness issue because there's all kinds of research showing that teams that are diverse do better work. And so if we want to be our best, we need to find ways. We're, and currently it's unacceptable where we're at. So uh, we're making it a big priority. We've, we've developed a, a task force uh, and now a permanent advisory committee around DEI. We launched a few months, well, at the annual conference in October, a CIO commitment statement We've already, and in which CIOs say, yes, I care about this, this is important, and I'm holding myself accountable to make progress on diversity, equity, and inclusion. We've already had 450 CIOs sign that statement. So we're really trying to work hard to make that a priority, and I would love to talk with other colleagues at UNIS and, and elsewhere about how we can make even more, because it's just not acceptable to be where we're at now. And actually, a couple years ago, a study came out that actually showed the number of women in computing science fields in the U.S. declining. <laughs> so, big priority. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Maybe one more question. Yes, Ian. Oh dear, ethical hacking and the ethics of that. I did mention that I'm not an ethics professor, right? <laughs> I, I, honestly, I, I, I'm not in a position to say. I mean, the, the, we, we're having so many people switch hats, black hat, white hat, and it's hard to keep track of it all. I think right now, it, uh, the metaphor that I settle on is uh, it's like the Wild West, and some, half the time we don't even know who the good, good people are and who to be afraid of. So I'd have to, that's a two-beer conversation. <laughs> Okay, thank you, John. Thank you Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> and the next session will start at uh, 3 o'clock sharp. Before that, it's time for having coffee and exhibitions.